All right, guys, this is it. Empires of the Ascended is launching. You can tell it's nighttime here. I'm up currently at time of recording the night before launch after having spent all day theory crafting 13 new decks using new cards to show you guys that you can play on day one of the expansion. Now, these are theory craft decks, which means they're going to be slightly unrefined. I'm tend to spend a lot of time and talk to a lot of players and try to come up with the most refined theorycraft decks I can, but I will still be making a decent amount of changes in the first day or two, so make sure to che check back for updated lists. In this video, I will be covering decks using all of the new champions, although I might have actually missed one of them. Uh, these decks will range from degrees of being very competitive towards very meme -y. and I'll try to have the more competitive ones at the top in general. There's a bit of a, you know, general decline towards the depths of raw meme towards the end, and you'll probably see that as it goes. If you want to play these decks on the site yourself, go ahead and go to the pinned comment where I'm linking it, and you can get Mobilytics updated decks through all of these. I have to put it through the link because the Mobilytics links are the only ones I am able to update. This site is not monetized. I'm not running ads. This is purely a resource I made for you guys to have better decks. All right, and without further ado, let's go ahead and get right into it. Starting at the top, again, these are going to be some of the more competitive one, Timelines Kindred. Now, you might notice that when I clicked that link just there, there's a, you know, this is not a Mobilytics link, as you would expect. That's because Mobilytics doesn't have links at time of recording. If you were to click on that on the page, you'd get to a Mobilytics page where you have an import. But for the rest of this video, you guys are going to be seeing screenshots because I don't have anything else yet. Okay, so this is Kindred Concurrent Timelines. This is actually going to be a fairly powerful list, although still need to be tweaking some of the ratios a bit to refine it. Concurrent Timelines, the new PNZ card, is pretty powerful and very cheap for what it does. At a very small deck building cost, you have the ability to upgrade your units for the rest of the game. Concurrent Timeline seems like a meme card at first, but as long as you don't build your entire deck around it and you just use it in a deck that happens to be gaining pretty good value from it, it'll do a crazy amount for a one mana card. Throughout the game, whenever we play Fading Icon, Blighted Caretaker, Jump Bomb, Spirit Leech, or of course, you know, Rekindler, Commander, Ledros, all of these cards will be upgrading in stats to whatever we choose. There will be a lot of positions where we'll get a potentially game-winning option off of one of them, and kind of the full combo at the end is meant to be finding Dreadway off of Commander Ledros and instead instantly killing the opponent's nexus. This is either a 50 or 60% chance we don't know yet because of like a minor, you know, miscommunication in the test build, but it's pretty good odds of being able to blow up the nexus from no matter what health it is, if you roll Dreadway off of Ledros, because Ledros' ability will be going off while you have Dreadway on board because of the timelines and the opponent's nexus is dead. Overall, a super fun deck that's going to play out pretty different every time just because concurrent timelines will cause some wacky stuff to happen. You will get some crazy power four drops in particular from stuff like Spirit Leech and Chump Wump. And it's just a lot of fun, especially for a deck that can win a lot of games. I'd also like to explain this one card, Passage Unearned. Passage Unearned is actually a pretty funny card in this upcoming metagame. I don't know if it'll stay in the deck for long, but it's a really cute thing to be running in the first several days of the meta due to its ability to kill a lot of the new cards, such as anything trying to be protected with Hourglass, Jarvan 4 dies to Passage Unearned, a lot of stuff from like the Talia package, uh, some of the stuff from the Lissandra package if you're actually like you know if the uh, thralls are coming out naturally the passage unearned can kill them there's just a lot of things that passage unearned hits right now so I think it's a cute one of in a decent amount of Shadow Isles decks for now and Kindred of course will be kind of like stalling out and controlling the board as soon as they're developed you're just gonna go ahead and be able to trigger slays on opponents units using stuff like Mystic Shot stuff like Vile Feast so that you are marking larger units with Kindred all right, so that's Timeline Kindreds. Next up, we have Fiora Shurima. Fiora Shurima, that's right. You guys know there's always going to be one thing 
for sure on every single Legends of Runeterra expansion, I'm gonna take a Fiora deck and I'm gonna make it nuts. And I've done just that. I think this deck is actually going to be pretty toxic. <laughs> this is Fiora like we've never seen her before. So not only does Shirima give Fiora access to the ability to tutor with Rite of Calling, we don't need entry anymore. Not only does Shirima give Fiora access to Rite of Negation, we don't need Deny, we can protect her with our ways. Shirima gives Quicksand, which is a really powerful blowout combo trick, combat trick, but most importantly, it gives us access to these lucky finds from Payday and Inner Sanctum. And lucky finds are really, really good in any deck that wants to go all in on single units like this. These are going to give Fiora permanently, these are permanent buffs, quick attack, tough, spell shield, or health buffs. And there are incredibly powerful options between those. We're always going to get something good for our Fiora here. Giving her quick attack permanently is really good and she'll be able to just have infinite health because you won't use it when you're challenging off units. Getting tough honestly sounds kind of lame because you already have chain vest, but if you don't have chain vest in your hand, you'd happily just scoop for a tough there in a lot of situations. And of course, spell shield on Fiora is just absolutely ridiculous and there's not much the opponent can do about it. In addition to that, we've got prediction tools. Aspiring Chronomancer and Ancient Preparations give us the ability to tailor the top of our deck into exactly what we're going to want to make sure this combo is hitting a little bit more efficiently and a little bit harder. And Ancient Hourglass, the star of the show, will keep Fiora protected from anything, even if they go into Hush the Fiora during combat, Hourglass saves her and you will get her back next turn, so no harm done. It might seem a little bit weird that we're running Exhaust in this list, but one of the more important things for Fiora is the ability to preemptively commit mana in a way that, you know, saves her life and forces the opponent to act when we've only committed one point of mana so that we have the ability to re-respond with maximum options. It's all about making the opponent act first in Fiora. So if you're going to play this deck, you're going to want to take a lot of passes. You're going to want to make sure that if you're passing to burn mana, you know, you force the opponent to make the first action and play super reactively as if this were a full control deck. All right next up, we've got Shereem Overwhelm. This is a sweet upgrade to styles of Overwhelm we've seen from Freljord and Noxus. There's been a lot of Overwhelm decks. It's been an archetype for a while, and Shereem has got some great additions to this. Most notably, Renekton and Ruin Runner. If you've played Overwhelm decks in the past, you know that Overwhelm's biggest weakness is that they really have almost nothing to play on turn 4 or turn 5, and they've had to use a lot of generally weaker cards to be able to fulfill that. Renekton and Ruin Runner help this perfectly. Shape Stone is an insane power card it's a ridiculous combat trick and we do have to run a couple landmarks in this deck to be able to get use out of it reliably but it is absolutely worth it and this one of scar grounds i know scar grounds is seen as a meme card but i actually like one of scar grounds in this deck we don't really have uh you know we're a little bit light on a proactive three drop we do need one more landmark because of shape stone being able to you know get reliable triggers and it's actually pretty good against stuff like tf and ice shards just as a one of to sometimes allow your units to survive just onslaughts of pings and make them all completely immune. Basically, just comparing it to the uh, temple that gives lucky finds, Scargons is a little bit better here. So, a super straightforward, proactive tempo deck that's just going to be smacking the opponent in the face. And this style of deck might end up being the strongest way to run Renekton as well. Alright, then there's Talia Aphelios. Talia Aphelios is a pretty standard deck from what you'd expect from Aphelios. Uh, they're not really interacting with each other in any sort of novel ways. Any sort of Aphelios archetype is going to be built around sticking Aphelios to the board, making sure you have the ability to protect him, and playing Veiled Temple to span weapons. Now, Aphelios is nerfed to two health, but this kind of archetype is still going to be very powerful. And with protection tools such as Ancient Hourglass, you know the drill with all these streaming cards, even Rite of Negation, and Preservarium to not run out of steam, Aphelios has some pretty good friends in Shirima. But the strongest thing that Talia offers this deck is the ability to clone Veiled Temple with her, which is actually really powerful. Veiled Temple is a card that when you get two of it, it just starts to snowball and kind of become tempo positive, winning you back the game. And Talia's interaction here is really powerful because of that.
All right, then we've got Bakai Aggro. So Bakai Aggro, you might notice, is effectively a spin on the kind of like they who endure style archetype. And this was a version that I built out with Precipic. Uh, effectively, Bakai Reaper, a super powerful, aggressive card, is going to do a really good job at comboing with early hands like Blighted Caretaker. You're going to trigger a lot of slays. Bakai Reaper is going to grow really large, really fast, and blow out out games like crazy now instead of endure atrocity we have a lot more uh, over the top in the form of ruinous path another slay trigger card and even rampaging Bakai this card is gonna be pretty good in a Shadow Isles deck that slays a lot I think Rampaging Bakai, a lot of people are expecting it to be easier to activate. I don't think you can run this in just any deck. You, it, it can be pretty good in decks that can slay a decent amount, but this is the one kind of deck where it will very reliably be triggered with its condition on turn 5. And it's got Overwhelm, which is really, really good for this style of aggressive deck. So, basically, think of it like a They Who Endure style deck, but with just a different kind of like later game condition. In addition to all of that, Dune Keeper is an amazing card for aggro, especially since we have the ability to sacrifice its token in a few ways. And then we've got a personal favorite deck of mine, Shirima Sparklefly. Now, I love this deck. I think this deck is pretty gross. And you know, that's saying something, because you guys know, I kind of despise Aphelios, but... This deck is just a little too much. So you guys obviously know all about Aphelios and Crescendum, you know, and pulling out these two mana units. Well, this one is taking that a step further. We've got Xenotype Researchers. This is going to be buffing the only two other units in our deck, Aphelios and Sparklefly. And what that's going to mean is sometimes we'll have a buff to Felios. That's quite nice. In reality, it means with just one or two Xenotype Researchers being played, we have the ability to pull out Sparkleflies with Crescendums that are at high odds of being buffed plus three plus three or more if we've played multiple Xenotype Researchers. This is incredibly powerful as being able to play a two mana Crescendum, pulling out a Sparklefly that is effectively a two mana 4-5 elusive lifesteal is absolutely crazy and because we have Sharima, we've got all the staples. We've got Rite of Calling giving us a reliable way of searching out Aphelios because we're not running another champion. It's just Aphelios being pulled out, which will in turn getting us Crescendum. Payday, in addition, is a sweet card with Aphelios because you can trigger Nightfall on turn two with Payday, then play Aphelios, and then use the Lucky Finds right away, hoping to get either like Spell Shield, maybe Tough, maybe Plus Health, but something that will allow him to, you know, trigger his ability and stay alive. In addition to all of that, one additional way we can use Ancient Hourglass, we don't have to use it to just protect Aphelios or Sparklefly in this deck because Ancient Hourglass resummons your unit, which means on turn Turn three, if I really just, if I already have a Felios and I just want to go for full power, I don't have to worry about what the opponent's doing. On turn three, I can play Xenotype Researchers and immediately just use Hourglass on her. She'll resummon to the board on turn four, meaning the summon effect will trigger twice and the Crescendums are going to go crazy with these buffed Sparkleflies. So, a pretty disgusting combo when it works out. Overall, the deck will win a lot of games just off of the back of using a lot of really powerful cards, Aphelios included. Uh, it probably won't end up being the most competitive way of playing Aphelios, but I think it's extremely disgusting when it works. And as far as Xenotype Researcher's decks goes, it might be the most effective way to use her to her full potential. All right, next up, we have Jarvan Elites. Now, this is actually a pretty interesting new take on a fairly old archetype. Of course, we have Elite Synergy, which has never really been like a long-term competitive mainstay, but because there's so many powerful new Elite cards, those being, you know, of course, Penitent Squire has Elite Synergy, Honored Lord is an Elite, um, we've got Gallant Rider, which is an Elite, and Jarvan and Jarvan the third are both elites. Suddenly, with a little bit more oomph, we have a lot more reason to use Battlesmith. In addition to that, Greenfang Warden, also an elite, hasn't really seen play before, but in this deck makes a lot of sense because of its ability to have the barrier attack, which is good for Jarvan's level condition, as well as Scout. 
Now, Scout has a really unique ability in this deck because if you open attack on turn six or seven with Scout, you can actually potentially attack twice with Jarvan four in a turn because, of course, the Scout attack will summon Jarvan like any other and you'll still have the second attack for that turn. But the real reason Scout is powerful here is because of Jarvan's Cataclysm, which is the case when you activate Jarvan's level up ability or when you double draw Jarvan. If you, on a defensive turn, use Cataclysm on a scout unit, you will rally for the turn. This is kind of counterintuitive, but because it generates a free attack and because scout reads, when you attack, reset, like, ready the attack, do a rally, it will rally you for the turn. So, a really cool combo, and here you can see we're splashing Shirima for a couple of exhausts so that we can get more reliable challenges with cards like Gallant Rider as well as Garen. Uh, Garen's really powerful when we can challenge into things with him. All right. Next up, the Azir deck, Azir Lucian. This one is actually pretty spicy, and this was a deck built by Precipic and Ganked. Basically, the idea behind this deck is we are using scouts, and scouts are going to be able to trigger Azir as well as Emperor's Dais multiple times, which gives you the ability to summon a bunch of soldiers to put on a lot of pressure. In addition to that, Lucian fits really perfectly with what Azir is trying to do because Lucian will level pretty fast in this deck. Overall, I think this kind of direction is probably going to be the strongest way to play Azir, just because he's a little bit limited in Mono Shrima being kind of awkward for a few reasons right now. So this is a really nice step and a way to try to make Azir uh, a lot more useful. As you can see, we're also running the one of Cataclysm and trying to combine it with Scouts for a free attack, plus the Rally in addition to that attack. And that brings me to our LeBlanc deck. Now I bet you thought that when I said I wasn't running one specific champion, you probably thought it was LeBlanc. Well, have no fear, LeBlanc actually has a little bit of a home. LeBlanc, being a little bit underwhelming, actually does fit perfectly into the Ash archetype. Because we have ways of being able to protect LeBlanc with Elixir of Iron and Troll Chant built in, we kind of need an extra 3-drop because, you know, Ash has always had Avaraz and Trapper, but wouldn't mind a couple of extra 3-drops. And most importantly, the Ash deck hasn't really been very reliant on any sort of champion slots here, so it's a perfect fit because it doesn't really have that downside of needing the champ slot as well. LeBlanc is just a nice, proactive turn 3 play that we are going to be able to use and start getting in some chip damage while enabling stuff like Whispered Words for draw, while enabling stuff like potentially Bloody Business or Reckoning. Uh, I might have to tweak those depending on how the meta shapes out. But overall, it's a deck where we're playing a bunch of high attack units. Our main win condition is going to be leveling the Ash, making sure that whole package goes off. And in this case, we've swapped the normal... Uh, Arvos and Hearthguard, sorry, I forgot the name for a second, for Kato, just because I think the LeBlanc version is able to use this a little bit better with the whole, like, plus attack for might sort of game plan. A super standard dash deck, if you want to try it out, a lot of the combos you'll be hitting revolve around Culling Strike, where you can freeze cards or you can reduce their attack with Troll Chant and clean things up with Culling Strike. This is one of the biggest reasons why Ash decks are even running Noxus. And of course, Reckoning, Culling Strike's big brother, can be an outright blowout in a lot of games. So, a super solid way of playing the new Ash. Next up, we have Predict Silver Renekton, which is a very interesting new build by Precipic as well. This one plays either Inner Sanctum or Xenotype Researchers on turn 3. On turn 4, because we've got so many powerful 4 drops in the Renekton or the Sivir, we're probably going to have reliable ways of having like Sanctum targets. So if we have a 4 drop, we can play Sanctum on 3. If we don't, we're going to have to wait on Researchers or something else. And we can start spamming buffs on these. Now, Renekton and Sivir are really good buff targets for if you are playing the Inner Sanctum, but also if you draw them later with the Xenotype Researchers. And there's a third card here that is really perfect for the Xenotype and Inner Sanctum kind of game plan, and that's Ruin Runner as well, the five mana card. Because it has Overwhelm and Spell Shield, it's also an amazing buff target with, yeah, Xenotype and Inner Sanctum. So we're gonna be using Inner Sanctum and Xenotype on like turn three or four. We're often going to be playing a really big bomb by turn five or six, something that 
has been uh, buffed up with Inner Sanctum or we've drawn it off of Xenotype. And the reason we have decent reliability on Xenotype, is we're not always going to have it on turn 6. It's a bit optimistic, but we have Predicts, right? We have the ability to use either Ancient Preparations or Aspiring Chronomancer and increase our odds of hitting one of our big scary bombs that can slap the board a really big buffed unit that will just go on to terrorize the rest of the game and we're even running a few of the kind of like noxus reputation package whispered words and trifarian assessor as well as reckoning so a different take on the idea of kind of like this reputation style game plan a pretty solid list and this one is for those that just want the feeling of having this crazy blowout when you're just like when you hit like powerful cards off of inner sanctum or you hit a powerful early buff draw off of xenotype you will just have some incredibly unfair power spikes on turn five or six and that brings us to lasandra talia all right this deck is wild this deck is crazy so first of all let me say we're reaching the end of this list i mentioned that things would start getting more and more meme -y, and this is kind of the bridge between like the full just onslaught of memes in these last two decks and a deck that you can see as something with real blowout potential because this deck is all over the place and it is using Lissandra and I don't think there's going to be a ton of competitive different competitive ways to run Lissandra but the idea of this deck is we are using Frozen Thrall very early of course we're hard mulliganing for Frozen Thrall and just trying to go for the Draclorn combo right so that we can sometimes have hatched thralls on turn six or seven seems normal we're doing a lot more in this deck though we have some full power otk combos that can win us the game on the spot if the opponent doesn't interact with them for example if you use promising future to clone your thrall and then use talia to clone that cloned thrall then suddenly when you play draclorn on turn six your turn seven will have four eight eight overwhelm units right obviously that's pretty idealistic but that's kind of the best case scenario and there's a lot of other ways this deck can actually nut out and combo it's an extremely flexible deck that is going to make you think on your feet while you're playing it because there's just a lot of wild combinations you'll have to be doing ancient hourglass for example is a great way to protect your own cards but you can then use promising future to redouble whatever you protected with Ancient Hourglass, which can be extremely powerful if it was something like a Talia as well. Basically, there's just a lot of different combos that this deck is really trying to play for. We've got a ton of power in stuff like Shapestone, just a super, super good one mana combat trick, and some built in reliability with Aspiring Chronomancer and Preservarium. Lissandra will also level up in this deck, and that will actually make a bit of a difference just because of the speed you'll have it online. and you know maybe sometimes you'll have a board where your frozen thralls get dealt with but your lissandra leveling is enough to start slowing down the game and kind of transitioning into that win condition now we start getting to mimir and mimir decks and that brings us to sun disc shirima so of course when you have 40 cards in shirima you start with buried sun disc in your opening hands this allows you to try to level up both champions, Azir and Renekton, which allow you to go into Ascended. When you just have two of them leveled up, you have the Azir, which will replace your Emperor deck, and you'll be able to basically win the game off of that. The tricky thing is it's actually really difficult to level up this many Ascendeds. Ascended's Rise is pretty cute in some like matchups where you have the curve for it, but overall, Mono Shirima feels like it is lacking tools to make it feeling cohesive or competitive. And I don't expect this deck to, you know, make any waves. Now, it's a lot of fun, you know, blowing out your opponent with the completed mini quest of Buried Sun Disc and the double level on your champions. And it'll happen uh, every once in a while. So overall, it's not going to be too bad or anything like that. I like this version of the deck for the most part. It's trying to level up Azir and Renekton as much as possible. And you guys might notice at this point that the one champion that I didn't end up including in any of these lists, although I was actually pretty close in a couple, was Nasus. Nasus feels like it isn't quite enough to make a home in this deck 
we really want to be drawing uh, the Renekton or the uh, Azir off of Golden Ambassador. We only need to level both. We don't need to level Nasus for the Buried Sun Disc payoff. And in addition to that, he's ends up being even harder to level than the other two for the amount of slaves we're going to have in this deck. So Nasus ends up slowing this deck down because Buried Sun Disc only needs you to see two Ascendants. Also, we're only running one Buried Sun Disc because... You don't draw more than one in the opening hand. If the opponent uses landmark removal on it and you trade up for an entire card and mana, you're already happy. You don't need more than one Buried Sun Disc, guys. I promise, okay? Because if you want to play multiple just to beat landmark removal, you ha it still kills your countdown and your countdown doesn't apply unless it's already on the board. So you have to play both of them early anyway. It just doesn't really make sense. It's all right that if your Buried Sun Disc gets removed, you're just having to deal with an amazing exchange, your opponent's way down, and yeah, you won't get to triple ascend that game. And with that, that brings me to deck number 13 in this list. Fisting Sivir. Now, Sivir is a very, very interesting card. Her ability to share keywords has invited a lot of interesting theory crafting. A lot of people have mentioned to me, you know, what if we give Sivir Fluria fists and make her double attack. And then she can share double attack with everything. To which I normally say, first of all, I don't even think that works because Zoe doesn't share double attack. Double attack is kind of coded to be an unshareable keyword. Maybe Sivir might. But second of all, it's not really that great because you'd usually just rather have overwhelm anyway. Double attack without overwhelm doesn't really do anything. But then I got to thinking, what if we didn't even try to level up Sivir? What if we just said, look, well, listen, Sivir is a four mana, five, three, spell shield quick attack. If we just give her double attack with Flurry of Fists and then get either Overwhelm off of one of the lucky finds or Elusive off of Ghost or something like that, she's just kind of the perfect Flurry of Fists target anyway, just because she has spell shield. Spell shield is incredibly powerful on units that already have good qualities of buff targets. I cannot stress enough how powerful the spell shield on Sivir and Ruin Runner is. And so this deck idea was born where it's an all in like aggro combo deck. We've got all the mainstays. We've got the Rite of Crawling, some of the predict cards, the Ancient Hourglass, Shapestone, you know the drill. And we're abusing a lot of the permanent grants. We're <laughs> flurry of fists for the double attack. And these spell shields are really hard. Now I'm using here Zed as an alternate target because when you take Zed and you give some, some powerful grant abilities, we have so many ways of keeping units alive and he will level up off of like overwhelm or elusive or just, you know, annoying your opponent enough. And at that point, he will have the ability to transfer everything to his clone, which is pretty powerful too. But the thing that's most interesting about this deck is Dawn and Dusk. Now, Dawn of Dusk has never really been a competitive card, and I don't expect it to. Guys, there's a reason this deck is last on my list, but look, listen. Spell Shield, again, makes a lot of things possible. And when we take something like a Spell Shielded buffed, like a double attack Sivir that's been Spell Shielded, and we do something like Shape Stone into Dawn and Dusk at the start of my turn for seven mana, if the opponent can't pop my spell shield and actually threaten this action in the same action, I kind of just win the game. Like if this Donna does it gets off and I have spell shield protecting it, we're just kind of good because shape stone is crazy. We're going to have like elusive or overwhelm to combo and we just have really powerful stats. Everything's going to have spell shield if the action goes through and the opponent's just going to get kind of blown out. You can use this on Ruin Runner too, and even Zed. Zed doesn't have Spell Shield himself, but you will be rolling Spell Shield sometimes off of Inner Sanctum and Payday. So the combo will work with him as well if he's the unit that you choose to keep alive for the game. So overall, it's a pretty hilarious aggro combo deck, a different take on it. It's not gonna be good. This one is like, look, this one. I can tell you guys this one's not gonna be good, but it's a pretty funny way to use, you know, a different form of this like aggro combo Shirima uh, tools that allow you to tutor things, that allow you to protect your things, that allow you to give your things buffs, right? 
And I'm going to have so much fun with these guys. I'm going to have so much fun with these. You guys might have noticed that literally like four or five decks on this list were using a lot of the same package, right? The stuff that like e even sometimes the Payday and the Inner Sanctum, although not necessarily a lot of the Ancient Hourglass and just early Shurima consistency tools like the Predicts, like Right of Calling. And I love these cards so much. There's so many cool ways to try to do these aggressive, tight combo decks with them some a lot more competitive than others but this is probably my favorite aspect of shirima and i'm looking forward to playing these decks all day tomorrow and you know i'm in all week because when the expansion comes out so if you're watching this right now if you're just finishing this video i'm probably streaming right now you can come stop by check it out it's gonna be a lot of fun i plan on playing for the most part I definitely will play the Kindred Timelines deck as well as the Fiora Shurima deck tomorrow. And I'll mess around with a ton of stuff. So I'm really looking forward to it. And I hope you guys stop by for the expansion launch. That is it for me this time. And I'll see you guys next time.